Welcome to the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. This is one of our exciting reading episodes. We will have a regular episode again next week. PGTTCM is part of the Dark Myths Collective. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, or any place you catch your podcasts. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and Twitter too. PGTTCM is brought to you by bunnyslippers.com and founditemclothing.com. Look to them for some really cool stuff. Want to help out PGTTCM? Why not donate a buck or five to PGTTCM at, uh, you could also donate some money to paypal.me slash PGTTCM. Or you could always become part of our t-shirt club, sticker club on patreon.com slash PGTTCM. And also, you can go to pgttcm.threadless.com to buy one of our shirts, stickers, whatnot, and yeah, thank you so much for your support. Today's reading is part one of Herbert West Reanimator, a public domain recording from LibriVox. And just a reminder, it was written by H.P. Lovecraft and first published in Homebrew Magazine February through July 1922, and then... uh, seen by the main public in March 1942 in a uh, issue of Weird Tales. So yeah, that's that's the uh, print history of Herbert West Reanimator. But yeah, it was written somewhere between 1921 and June 1922, and uh, is uh, Lovecraft's attempt at uh, humor. <laughs> so... There's that. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bonha. Herbert West. Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft. Part A. To be dead, to be truly dead, must be glorious. There are far worse things awaiting man than death. Count Dracula Part 1. From the Dark Of Herbert West, who was my friend in college and in afterlife, I can speak only with extreme terror. This terror is not due altogether to the sinister manner of his recent disappearance, but was engendered by the whole nature of his life work, and first gained its acute form more than seventeen years ago, when we were in the third year of our course at the Miskatonic University Medical School in our camp. While he was with me, the wonder and diabolism of his experiments fascinated me utterly, and I was his closest companion. Now that he is gone and the spell is broken, the actual fear is greater. Memories and possibilities are even more hideous than reality. The first horrible incident of our acquaintance was the greatest shock I ever experienced, and it is only with reluctance that I repeat it. As I have said, it happened when we were in the medical school, where West had already made himself notorious through his wild theories on the nature of death and the possibility of overcoming it artificially. His views, which were ridiculed by the faculty and by his fellow students, hinged on the essentially mechanistic nature of life, and concerned means for operating the organic machinery of mankind by calculated chemical action after the failure of natural processes. In his experiments with the various animating solutions, he had killed and treated immense numbers of rabbits, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, and monkeys till he had become the prime nuisance of the college. Several times he had actually obtained signs of life in animals supposedly dead, in many cases, violent signs, but he soon saw that the perfection of his process, if indeed possible, would necessarily involve a lifetime of research. It likewise became clear that, since the same solution never worked alike on different organic species, he would require human subjects for further and more specialized progress. It was here that he first came into conflict with the college authorities and was debarred from further experiments by no less a dignitary than the dean of the medical school himself, 
the learned and benevolent Dr. Alan Halsey, whose work in behalf of the stricken is recalled by every old resident of Arkham. I had always been exceptionally tolerant of West's pursuits, and we frequently discussed his theories, whose ramifications and corollaries were almost infinite. Holding with Haeckel that all life is a chemical and physical process, and that the so-called soul is a myth, my friend believed that artificial reanimation of the dead can depend only on the condition of the tissues, and that unless actual decomposition has set in, a corpse fully equipped with organs may, with suitable measures, be set going again in the peculiar fashion known as life. That the psychic or intellectual life might be impaired by the slight deterioration of sensitive brain cells, which even a short period of death would be apt to cause West fully realized. It had been, at first, his hope to find a reagent which would restore vitality before the actual advent of death, and only repeated failures on animals had shown him that the natural and artificial life motions were incompatible. He then sought extreme freshness in his specimen, injecting his solution into the blood immediately after the extinction of life. It was this circumstance which made the professors so carelessly skeptical for they felt that true death had not occurred in any case. They did not stop to view the matter closely and reasoningly. It was not long after the faculty had interdicted his work that West confided to me his resolution to get fresh human bodies in some manner and continue in secret the experiments he could no longer perform openly. To hear him discussing ways and means was rather ghastly, for at the college we had never procured anatomical specimens ourselves. Whenever the morgue proved inadequate, two local Negroes attended to this matter, and they were seldom questioned. West was then a small, slender, spectacled youth with delicate features, yellow hair, pale blue eyes, and a soft voice, and it was uncanny to hear him dwelling on the relative merits of Christchurch Cemetery and the Potter's Field. We finally decided on the potter's field because practically everybody in Christchurch was embalmed, a thing, of course, ruinous to West's researches. I was, by this time, his active and enthralled assistant and helped him make all his decisions, not only concerning the source of bodies, but concerning a suitable place for our loathsome work. It was I who thought of the deserted Chapman farmhouse beyond Meadow Hill, where we fitted up on the ground floor an operating room and a laboratory, each with dark curtains to conceal our midnight doings. The place was far from any road and in sight of no other house, yet precautions were nonetheless necessary, since rumors of strange light started by chance nocturnal roamers would soon bring disaster on our enterprise. It was agreed to call the whole thing a chemical laboratory if discovery should occur. Gradually, we equipped our sinister haunt of science with materials either purchased in Boston or borrowed quietly from the college, materials carefully made unrecognizable save to expert eyes, and provided spades and picks for the many burials we should have to make in the cellar. At the college, we used an incinerator, but the apparatus was too costly for our unauthorized laboratory. Bodies were always a nuisance, even the small guinea pig bodies from the slight clandestine experiments in West's room at the boarding house. We followed the local death notices like ghouls, for our specimens demanded particular qualities. What we wanted were corpses interred soon after death and without artificial preservation, preferably free from malforming disease and certainly with all organs present. Accident victims were our best hope. Not for many weeks did we hear of anything suitable, though we talked with Morgan hospital authorities, ostensibly in the college's interest, as often as we could without exciting suspicion. We found that the college had the first choice in every case, so that it might be necessary to remain in Arkham during the summer, when only the limited summer school classes were held. In the end, though, luck favored us, for one day we heard of an almost ideal case in the potter's field, a brawny young workman drowned only the morning before in Summer's Pond and buried at the town's expense without delay or embalming. That afternoon we found the new grave and determined to begin work soon after midnight. It was a repulsive task that we undertook in the black small hours, 
even though he lacked at that time the special horror of graveyards, which later experiences brought to us. We carried spades and oil dark lanterns, for although electric torches were then manufactured, they were not as satisfactory as the tungsten contrivances of today. The process of unearthing was slow and sordid. It might have been gruesomely poetical if we had been artists instead of scientists. And we were glad when our spades struck wood. When the pine box was fully uncovered, Wes scrambled down and removed the lid, dragging out and propping up the contents. I reached down and hauled the contents out of the grave and then both toiled hard to restore the spot to its former appearance. The affair made us rather nervous, especially the stiff form and the vacant face of our first trophy, but we managed to remove all traces of our visit. When we had patted down the last shovel full of earth, we put the specimen in a canvas sack and set out for the old Chapman place beyond Meadow Hill. On an improvised dissecting table in the old farmhouse, by the light of a powerful acetylene lamp, the specimen was not very spectral looking. It had been a sturdy and apparently unimaginative youth of wholesome plebeian type, large framed, gray eyed, and brown haired, a sound animal without psychological subtleties, and probably having vital processes of the simplest and healthiest sort. Now, with the eyes closed, it looked more sweet than dead though the expert tests of my friend soon left no doubt on that score. We had at last what West had always longed for, a real dead man of the ideal kind, ready for the solution as prepared according to the most careful calculations and theories for human use. The tension on our part became very great. We knew that there was scarcely a chance for anything like complete success and could not avoid hideous fears at possible grotesque results of partial animation, especially were we apprehensive concerning the mind and the impulses of the creature, since in the space following death some of the more delicate cerebral cells might well have suffered deterioration. I, myself, still held some curious notions about the traditional soul of man, and felt an awe at the secrets that might be told by one returning from the dead. I wondered what type this placid youth might have seen in inaccessible spheres and what he could relate if fully restored to life. But my wonder was not overwhelming, since for the most part I shared the materialism of my friend. He was calmer than I as he forced a large quantity of his fluid into a vein in the body's arm, immediately binding the incision securely. The waiting was gruesome, but West never faltered. Every now and then he applied his stethoscope to the specimen and bore the negative results philosophically. After about three quarters of an hour, without the least sign of life, he disappointedly pronounced the solution inadequate, but determined to make the most of his opportunity and try one change in the formula before disposing of his ghastly prize. We had that afternoon dug a grave in the cellar and would have to fill it by dawn, for although we had fixed the lock on the house, we wished to shun even the remotest risk of a ghoulish discovery. Besides, the body would not be even approximately fresh the next night. So, taking the solitary acetylene lamp into the adjacent laboratory, we left our silent guest on the slab in the dark and bent every energy to the mixing of a new solution, the weighing and measuring supervised by West with an almost fanatical care. The awful event was very sudden and wholly unexpected. I was pouring something from one test tube to another, and West was busy over the alcohol blast lamp, which had to answer for a Bunsen burner in this gasless edifice, when, from the pitch-black room we had left, there burst the most appalling and demonic succession of cries that either of us had ever heard. Not more unutterable could have been the chaos of hellish sound if the pit itself had opened to release the agony of the damned, for in one inconceivable cacophony was centered all the supernal terror and the unnatural despair of animate nature. Human it could not have been. It is not in man to make such sounds, and without a thought of our late employment or its possible discovery, both West and I leapt to the nearest window like stricken animals, overturning tubes, lamp, and retorts, and vaulting madly into the starred abyss of the rural night. 
I think we screamed ourselves as we stumbled frantically toward the town, though as we reached the outskirts, we put on a semblance of restraint, just enough to seem like belated revelers staggering home from a debauch. We did not separate, but managed to get to West's room, where we whispered with the gas up until dawn. By then, we had calmed ourselves a little with rational theories and plans for investigation, so that we could sleep through the day, classes being disregarded. But that evening, two items in the paper, wholly unrelated, made it again impossible for us to sleep. The old deserted Chapman house had inexplicably burned to an amorphous heap of ashes. That we could understand because of the upset lamp. Also, an attempt had been made to disturb a new grave in the potter's field, as if by futile and spadeless clawing at the earth. That we could not understand, for we had patted down the mold very carefully. And for seventeen years after that, West would look frequently over his shoulder and complain of fancied footsteps behind him. Now he has disappeared. Part Two The Plague Demon I shall never forget that hideous summer sixteen years ago, when like a noxious effort from the halls of Eblis, typhoid stalked leeringly through Arkham. It is by that satanic scourge that most recall the year, for truly horror brooded with bad wings over the piles of coffins in the tombs of Christ Church Cemetery. Yet for me, there is a greater horror in that time, a horror known to me alone now that Herbert West has disappeared. West and I were doing postgraduate work in summer classes at the medical school of Miskatonic University, and my friend had attained a wide notoriety because of his experiments leading toward the revivification of the dead. After scientific slaughter of uncounted small animals, the freakish work had ostensibly stopped by order of our skeptical dean, Dr. Alan Halsey, though West had continued to perform certain secret tests in his dingy boarding house room and had on one terrible and unforgettable occasion taken a human body from its grave in the potter's field to a deserted farmhouse beyond the meadow hill. I was with him on that odious occasion and saw him inject into the still veins the elixir which he thought would to some extent restore life's chemical and physical processes it had ended horribly, in a delirium of fear which we gradually came to attribute to our own overwrought nerves, and Wes had never afterward been able to shake off the maddening sensation of being haunted and hunted. The body had not been quite fresh enough. It is obvious that to restore normal mental attributes, a body must be very fresh indeed, and the burning of the old house had prevented us from burying the thing. It would have been better if we could have known it was underground. After that experience, West had dropped his researches for some time, but the zeal of the born scientist slowly returned, and he again became importunate with the college faculty, pleading for the use of the dissecting room and of fresh human specimens for the work he regarded as so overwhelmingly important. His pleas, however, were wholly in vain for the decision of Dr. Halsey was inflexible, and the other professors all endorsed the verdict of their leader. In the radical theory of reanimation, they saw nothing but the immature vagarities of a youthful enthusiast whose slight form, yellow hair, spectacled blue eyes, and soft voice gave no hint of the supernormal, almost diabolical power of the cold brain within. I can see him now as he was then, and I shiver. He grew sterner of face, but never elderly. And now Sefton Asylum has had the mishap, and West has vanished. West clashed disagreeably with Dr. Halsey near the end of our last undergraduate term in a wordy dispute that did less credit to him than to the kindly dean in point of courtesy. He felt that he was needlessly and irrationally retarded in a supremely great work a work which he could, of course, conduct to suit himself in later years, but which he wished to begin while still possessed of the exceptional facilities of the university. That the tradition-bound elders should ignore his singular results on animals and persist in their denial of the possibility of reanimation 
was inexpressibly disgusting and almost incomprehensible to a youth of West's logical temperament. Only greater maturity could help him understand the chronic mental limitations of the professor-doctor type, the product of generations of pathetic puritanism, kindly, conscientious, and sometimes gentle and amiable, yet always narrow, intolerant, custom-ridden, and lacking in perspective. Age has more charity for these incomplete, yet high-souled characters whose worst real vice is timidity and who are ultimately punished by general ridicule for their intellectual sins, sins like Ptolemaism, Calvinism, anti-Darwinism, and anti-Nietzscheism, and every sort of Sabbatinarianism and sumptuary legislation. West, young despite his marvelous scientific acquirements, had scant patience with good Dr. Halsey and his erudite colleagues, and nursed an increasing resentment, coupled with a desire to prove his theories to these obtuse worthies in some striking and dramatic fashion. Like most youth, he indulged in elaborate daydreams of revenge, triumph, and final magnanimous forgiveness. And then had come the scourge, grinning and lethal, from the nightmare caverns of Tartarus, West and I had graduated about the time of its beginning, but had remained for additional work at the summer school, so that we were in our camp when it broke with full demonic fury upon the town. Though not as yet licensed physicians, we now had our degrees and were pressed frantically into the public service as the number of the stricken grew. The situation was almost past management, and deaths ensued too frequently for the local undertakers to handle. Burials without embalming were made in rapid succession, and even the Christchurch Cemetery receiving tomb was crammed with coffins of the unembalmed dead. This circumstance was not without effect on West, who thought often of the irony of the situation, so many fresh specimens, yet none for his persecuted researches. We were frightfully overworked, and the terrific mental and nervous strain made my friend rude morbidly. But West gentle enemies were no less harassed with prostrating duties. College had all but closed, and every doctor of the medical faculty was helping to fight the typhoid plague. Dr. Halsey in particular had distinguished himself in sacrificing service, applying his extreme skills with wholehearted energy to cases which many others shunned because of danger or apparent hopelessness. Before a month was over, the fearless Dean had become a popular hero though he seemed unconscious of his fame as he struggled to keep from collapsing with physical fatigue and nervous exhaustion. West could not withhold admiration for the fortitude of his foe, but because of this was even more determined to prove to him the truth of his amazing doctrine. Taking advantage of the disorganization of both college work and municipal health regulations, he managed to get a recently deceased body smuggled into the university dissecting room one night and, in my presence, injected a new modification of his solution. The thing actually opened its eyes, but only stared at the ceiling with a look of soul-petrifying horror before collapsing in an inertness from which nothing could rouse it. West said it was not fresh enough. The hot summer air does not favor corpses. That time, we were almost caught before we incinerated the thing and West doubted the advisability of repeating his daring misuse of the college laboratory. The peak of the epidemic was reached in August. West and I were almost dead, and Dr. Halsey did die on the 14th. The students all attended the hasty funeral on the 15th and bought an impressive wreath, though the latter was quite overshadowed by the tributes sent by wealthy Arkham citizens and by the municipality itself. It was almost a public affair, for the dean had surely been a public benefactor. After the entombment, we were all somewhat depressed and spent the afternoon at the bar of the commercial house, where West, though shaken by the death of his chief opponent, chilled the rest of us with references to his notorious series. Most of the students went home or to various duties as the evening advanced, but West persuaded me to aid him in making a night of it. West's landlady saw us arrive at his room about two in the morning with a third man between us, and told her husband that we had all evidently dined and wined rather well. Apparently, this assiduous matron was right, for about 3 a.m. the whole house was aroused by cries coming from West's room, 
where, when they broke down the door, they found the two of us unconscious on the blood-stained carpet, beaten, scratched, and mauled, and with the broken remnants of West's bottles and instruments around us. Only an open window told what had become of our assailant, and many wondered how he himself had fared after the terrific leap from the second story to the lawn which he must have made. There were some strange garments in the room, but West, upon regaining consciousness, said that they did not belong to the stranger, but were specimens collected for bacteriological analysis in the course of investigations on the transmission of germ diseases. He ordered them burnt as soon as possible in the capacious fireplace. To the police, we both declared ignorance of our late companion's identity. He was, West nervously said, a congenial stranger whom we had met at some downtown bar of uncertain location. We had all been rather jovial, and West and I did not wish to have our pugnacious companion hunted down. That same night saw the beginning of the second Arkham horror, the horror that to me eclipsed the plague itself. Christchurch Cemetery was the scene of a terrible killing, a watchman having been clawed to death in a manner not only too hideous for description, but raising a doubt as to the human agency of the deed. The victim had been seen alive considerably after midnight. The dawn revealed the unutterable thing. The manager of a circus at the neighboring town of Fulton was questioned, but he swore that no beast had at any time escaped from its cage. Those who found the body noted a trail of blood leading to the receiving tomb, where a small pool of red lay on the concrete just outside the gate. A fainter trail led away toward the woods, but it soon gave out. The next night, devils danced on the roofs of Arkham, and a natural madness howled in the wind. Through the fevered town had crept a curse which some said was greater than the plague, and which some whispered was the embodied demon soul of the plague itself. Eight houses were entered by a nameless thing which strewed red death in its wake. In all, seventeen maimed and shapeless remnants of bodies were left behind by a voiceless, sadistic monster that crept abroad. A few persons had half seen it in the dark, and said it was white and like a malformed ape or anthropomorphic fiend. It had not left behind quite all that it had attacked, for sometimes it had been hungry. The number it had killed was fourteen. Three of the bodies had been in stricken homes and had not been alive. On the third night, frantic bands of searchers, led by the police, captured it in a house on Crane Street near the Miskatonic campus. They had organized the quest with care, keeping in touch by means of volunteer telephone stations, and when someone in the college district had reported hearing a scratching at a shuttered window, the net was quickly spread. On account of the general alarm and precautions, there were only two more victims, and the capture was effected without major casualties. The thing was finally stopped by a bullet, though not a fatal one and was rushed to the local hospital amidst universal excitement and loathing. For it had been a man. This much was clear, despite the nauseous eyes, the voiceless simianism, and the demonic savagery. They dressed its wound and carted it to the asylum at Sefton, where it beat its head against the walls of a padded cell for sixteen years, until the recent mishap, when it escaped under circumstances that few like to mention. What had most disgusted the searchers of our camp was the thing they noticed when the monster's face was cleaned, the mocking, unbelievable resemblance to a learned and self-sacrificing martyr who had been entombed but three days before, the late Dr. Alan Halsey, public benefactor and dean of the medical school of Miskatonic University. To the vanished Herbert West and to me, the disgust and horror were supreme. I shudder tonight as I think of it, shudder even more than I did that morning when West muttered through his bandages, Damn, it wasn't quite fresh enough. Part 3. Six Shots by Moonlight It is uncommon to fire all six shots of a revolver with great suddenness when one would probably be sufficient, but many things in the life of Herbert West were uncommon. It is, for instance, not often that a young physician leaving college is obligated to conceal the principles which guide his selection of a house and office. Yet, that was the case with Herbert West. When he and I obtained our degrees at the medical school of Miskatonic University, 
and sought to relieve our poverty by setting up as general practitioners. We took great care not to say that we chose our home because it was fairly well isolated and as near as possible to the potter's field. Reticence such as this is seldom without a cause, nor indeed was ours, for our requirements were those resulting from a life work distinctly unpopular. Outwardly, we were doctors only, but beneath the surface were aims of far greater and more terrible moment. For the essence of Herbert West's existence was a quest amid black and forbidden realms of the unknown, in which he hoped to uncover the secret of life and restore to perpetual animation the graveyard's cold clay. Such a quest demands strange materials, among them fresh human bodies, and in order to keep supplied with these indispensable things, one must live quietly and not far from a place of informal internment. West and I had met in college, and I had been the only one to sympathize with his hideous experiments. Gradually, I had come to be his inseparable assistant, and now that we were out of college, we had to keep together. It was not easy to find a good opening for two doctors in company. But finally, the influence of the university secured us a practice in Bolton, a factory town near Arkham, the seat of the college. The Bolton Worsted Mills are the largest in the Miskatonic Valley, and their polyglot employees are never popular as patients with the local physicians. We chose our house with the greatest care, seizing at last on a rather run-down cottage near the end of Pond Street, five numbers from the closest neighbor and separated from the local potter's field by only a stretch of meadowland bisected by a narrow neck of the rather dense forest which lies to the north. The distance was greater than we wished, but we could get no nearer house without going on the other side of the field, wholly out of the factory district. We were not much displeased, however, since there were no people between us and our sinister source of supplies. The walk was a trifle long, but we could haul our silent specimens undisturbed. Our practice was surprisingly large from the very first, large enough to please most young doctors and large enough to prove a bore and a burden to students whose real interest lay elsewhere. The mill hands were of somewhat turbulent inclinations, and besides their many natural needs, their frequent clashes and stabbing affrays gave us plenty to do. But what actually absorbed our minds was the secret laboratory we had fitted up in the cellar, the laboratory with the long table under the electric light, where in the small hours of the morning we often injected West's various solutions into the veins of the things we dragged from the potter's field. West was experimenting madly to find something which would start man's vital motions anew after they had been stopped by the thing we called death, but had encountered the most ghastly obstacle. The solution had to be differently compounded for different types. What would serve for guinea pigs would not serve for human beings, and different human specimens required large modifications. The bodies had to be exceedingly fresh, or the slight decomposition of brain tissue would render perfect reanimation impossible. Indeed, the greatest problem was to get them fresh enough. West had had horrible experiences during his secret college researches with corpses of doubtful vintage. The results of partial or imperfect animation were much more hideous than were the total failures, and we both held fearsome recollections of such things. Ever since our first demonic session in the deserted farmhouse on Meadow Hill in our camp, we had felt a brooding menace. And West, though a calm, blonde, blue-eyed scientific automaton in most respects, often confessed to a shuddering sensation of stealthy pursuit. He half felt that he was followed psychological delusion of shaken nerves enhanced by the undeniably disturbing fact that at least one of our reanimated specimens was still alive, a frightful, carnivorous thing in a padded cell at Sefton. There was another, our first, whose exact fate we had never learned. We had fair luck with specimens in Bolton, much better than in our camp. We had not been settled a week before we got an accident victim on the very night of burial and made it open its eyes with an amazingly rational expression before the solution failed. It had lost an arm. If it had been a perfect body, we might have succeeded better. Between then and the next January, we secured three more. One total failure, one case of marked muscular motion, 
and one rather shivery thing. It rose of itself and uttered a sound. Then came a period where luck was poor. Interments fell off, and those that did occur were of specimens either too diseased or too maimed for use. We kept track of all the deaths and their circumstances with systematic care. One March night, however, we unexpectedly obtained a specimen which did not come from the potter's field. In Bolton, the prevailing spirit of Puritanism had outlawed the sport of boxing, with the usual result. Surreptitious and ill-conducted bouts among the mill workers were common, and occasionally professional talent of low grade was imported. This late winter night, there had been such a match, evidently with disastrous results, since two timorous Poles had come to us with incoherently whispered entreaties to attend to a very secret and desperate case. We followed them to an abandoned barn, where the remnants of a crowd of frightened foreigners were watching a silent black form on the floor. The match had been between Kid O'Brien, a lubberly and now quaking youth with a most un-Hiberian hooked nose, and Buck Robinson, the Harlem smoke. The Negro had been knocked out, and a moment's examination showed us that he would permanently remain so. He was a loathsome, gorilla-like thing, with abnormally long arms, which I could not help calling four legs, and a face that conjured up thoughts of unspeakable Congo secrets and Tom-Tom pounding under an eerie moon. The body must have looked even worse in life, but the world holds many ugly things. Fear was upon the whole pitiful crowd, for they did not know what the law would extract from them if the affair were not hushed up, and they were grateful when Wes, in spite of my involuntary shudders, offered to get rid of the thing quietly, for a purpose I knew too well. There was bright moonlight over the snowless landscape, but we dressed the thing and carried it home between us through the deserted streets and meadows, as we had carried a similar thing one horrible night in our camp. We approached the house from the field in the rear, and took the specimen in the back door and down the cellar stairs and prepared it for the usual experiment. Our fear of the police was absurdly great, though we had timed our trip to avoid the solitary patrolman of that section. The result was wearily anticlimactic. Ghastly as our prize appeared, it was wholly unresponsive to every solution we injected in its black arms, solutions prepared from experience with white specimens only. So as the hour grew dangerously near to dawn, we did as we had done with the others, dragged the thing across the meadows to the neck of the woods near the potter's field, and buried it there in the best sort of grave the frozen ground would furnish. The grave was not very deep, but fully as good as that of the previous specimen, the thing which had risen of itself and uttered a sound. In the light of our dark lanterns, we carefully covered it with leaves and dead vines, fairly certain that the police would never find it in a forest so dim and dense. The next day, I was increasingly apprehensive about the police, for a patient brought rumors of a suspected fight and death. West had still another source of worry, for he had been called in the afternoon to a case which ended very threateningly. An Italian woman had become hysterical over her missing child, a lad of five who had strayed off early in the morning and failed to appear for dinner, and had developed symptoms highly alarming in view of an always weak heart. It was a very foolish hysteria, for the boy had often run away before, but Italian peasants are exceedingly superstitious, and this woman seemed as much harassed by omens as by facts. About seven o'clock in the evening she had died, and her frantic husband had made a frightful scene in his efforts to kill West, whom he wildly blamed for not saving her life. Friends had held him back when he drew a stiletto, but West departed amidst his inhuman shrieks, curses, and oaths of vengeance. In his latest affliction, the fellow seems to have forgotten his child, who was still missing as the night advanced. There was some talk of searching the woods, but most of the family's friends were busy with the dead woman and the screaming man. Altogether, the nervous strain upon West must have been tremendous. Thoughts of the police and of the mad Italian both weighed heavily. We retired about eleven, but I did not sleep well. Bolton had a surprisingly good police force for so small a town, and I could not help fearing the mess which would ensue if the affair of the night before were ever tracked down. It might mean the end of all our local work, and perhaps prison for both West and me. 
I did not like those rumors of a fight which were floating about. After the clock had struck three, the moon shone in my eyes, but I turned over without rising to pull down the shade. Then came the steady rattling at the back door. I lay still and somewhat dazed, but before long heard West's rap on my door. He was clad in dressing gown and slippers, and had in his hands a revolver and an electric flashlight. From the revolver, I knew that he was thinking more of the crazed Italian than of the police. We'd better both go, he whispered. It wouldn't do not to answer it anyway, and it may be a patient. It would be like one of those fools to try the back door. So we both went down the stairs on tiptoe, with a fear partly justified and partly that which comes only from the soul of the weird small hours. The rattling continued, growing somewhat louder. When we reached the door, I cautiously unbolted it and threw it open. As the moon streamed revealingly down on the form silhouetted there, West did a peculiar thing. Despite the obvious danger of attracting notice and bringing down on our heads the dreaded police investigation, a thing which, after all, was mercifully averted by the relative isolation of our cottage, my friend suddenly, excitedly, and unnecessarily emptied all six chambers of his revolver into the nocturnal visitor. For that visitor was neither Italian nor policeman. Looming hideously against the spectral moon was a gigantic, misshapen thing not to be imagined save in nightmares. A glassy-eyed, ink-black apparition nearly on all fours, covered with bits of mold, leaves, and vines, foul with caked blood, and having between its glistening teeth a snow-white, terrible, cylindrical object terminating in a tiny hand. End of Herbert West, Reanimator, Part A. Thank you for listening to the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Join us next time when we have a full episode. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and at pgtcm.com and pgttcm.podbean.com. People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Check out darkmyths.org to find out more about them and some really cool podcasts. This episode has been edited by D.B. Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. You've been listening to The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. P-G-T-T-C-M dot com. <laughs> Stay squiggly, keep it weird, or... Stay weird and keep it squiggly. Whichever you want to do, you do it.